I wasn't focused on my goals Just sat me down for two eleven to pack them clothes When them doors open up, hit that yard and take that stroll And if your homie gotta go, it's hard, can't he fucking hold I was raised in the system, never played the victim Hey yo, what's good with everybody, man? I hope everybody's having a productive day. Feeling blessed, and like I always say, it's one life, one chance. We only got one chance to do this right. Let's get it done. With that being said, I got another story for you guys, provided by one of my subscribers from the Clovers Gang. Let's get right into it. With that being said, hit that subscribe button, hit that like, always leave a comment. Let me know what you guys think in the comment section. Check the links in the description for my Apple and Spotify music. Go ahead and run my streams up, and you can check out a playlist section on my YouTube channel. Check out my music right there. Thank you guys for you guys' time. Most importantly, thank you guys for you guys' support. Now, this happened around the time that Anthony Tonito Rodriguez, Mexican Mafia member, before he got killed, right? So, we're talking about a couple of homies from the same neighborhood, from Clover's gang, who was beefing at the time with El Sereno Rifa, a gang that was a rival gang. Well, trip out on this, right? So, they wound up getting kicked out of the school that they were going to. And they had to go to school in middle high school in Sereno. So what happened was they go to the school and they realize, man, we were surrounded by all the enemy guys, all of them. So what's going to happen? Two Sudanian values who can't stand aside of each other, they start beefing one another. They're getting off in the bathrooms, they're getting off in the hallways, in the quad area. They probably had a food fight in the kitchen area, you know what I mean? It was, it was all out season, right? It got so bad that one of them actually tried to get on the bus on the way home. And a couple of Sureños from El Sereno, Rifa, wind up jumping one of their homies. They weren't there. They weren't present at the time. But one of the homies gets caught by the school bus. And they beat him bad. And the only thing that saved this kid's life, right, is he jumped on the school bus. And the school bus driver seen that he was getting mauled to death. And he managed to shut the door on his rival gang members so they couldn't reach him no more. And drove off real fast. So, yes, the yellow school bus did save him. And you know, I'm pretty sure, you know what I mean, that he was grateful for it. I know I'd be grateful for it. But the, the middle school principal hears about it. And he sees that this has been a problem amongst these two particular groups. So he brings the, uh, he brings the homies from, uh, from Clover's gang into the office. And there's like three or four of them, if I'm not mistaken. And he tells them, like, look, since you guys came to school here, it's been all out gang fights. You guys versus these guys that already been here. This principal didn't know too much about the gangs and why they were fighting, but he just knew there was constant reports by the teachers, by other students, that these two gangs would meet up somewhere in the school, under the bleachers, in the fields, four against 10, 20. And they were always fighting on campus and off campus. Now, I don't know the history, but maybe the people in my audience in my comment section can elaborate on why Clover Street Gang and El Sereno Arifa they actually beef. You know, I would like to know. I'll be, I would love to be educated on that aspect. He didn't share that part with me. He just, just said it's an old gang rivalry dating way back in the day, like rocking chairs. So the principal tells him, hey, you guys either can get on the bus together. You guys need to be the first ones on the bus and get a ride home or somebody has to come pick you up. But you guys are going to knock them walk home no more because it was a constant report. Every time these guys would walk home, they were getting jumped by El Sereno all the time, so they, there was there was nothing they could do. You know, you're in enemy territory. You're behind enemy lines, bro. Your life's at stake. So they thought about it, and they said, all right, the homie goes, hey, bro, my dad can come pick us up every day after school. So one day, his dad picks him up after school, and his dad tells him, hey, bro, I'm going to pull over real quick, and I'm going to get some gas. And they're like smack middle in El Sereno Rifa's neighborhood right there. And the dad, the dad don't know nothing was going on, so he's like, hey, man, you guys want to go inside and get some snacks? So him and his homies are like, all right, so they get out. And what's, what do they notice? Our car pulls up at the red light. Who's in that car? Tonito. Tonito's right there with a bunch of dudes from ESR. And now they're tripping. They're, 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 they're sweating balls right now. They're tripping. They're caca bricks. And they're like, damn, bro. Like, It's one thing to go at it with the young neighborhood and the rest of the vatos. But we can't do nothing with Tonito in the car. Like, what are we supposed to do? First of all, you got Tonito out here letting it happen. When there was a policy that the Mexican Mafia incorporated on the streets, no body of warfare, this dude's letting it happen. He don't care. So you got ESR driving around, walking around, beating everybody up if they're Sureños from rival gang members, and they're not being told nothing, and they're not being put in check because Tonito's allowing it to happen. So they're walking around like they run the joint. They run the city. They can do whatever they want because Tonito's giving the blessings. They're untouchable. So how are you supposed to fight against that, against tyranny that an individual 
is allowing anything to happen. But at the moment you touch one of his youngsters in front of him, that's green light. You're good as dead. So they're sitting there talking about it like, bro, if he notices us and those youngsters, then they notice us too. They're going to get off on us, bro. Like, what are we supposed to do? Like, do we fight back? Because if we fight back and Tonito's there, he's going to green light us. But we're not going to just sit here and let these fools sock us up at this gas station in front of his dad and not do nothing about it just because Tonito's there. So they were put in an ugly predicament, but they're right there. They're getting ready and they're saying, look, whatever happens, happens, bro. Let it play out. And then, you know, obviously the stroke by a stroke of luck, our car pulls up next to Tonito. They said it was a black truck. And just the dude hangs out from the passenger seat, reaches over by the driver, and dumps and shoots Tonito in the face. They said that all they seen was the, 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 the truck speed off and the car just rolled slowly through traffic and just hit, hit, I think he hit a pole or something. And they were like, oh, they were tripping out like, damn, fool. They, they watched the Mexican mafia member, a known Mexican mafia member that was out there trying to tax Lowell Street and every other Sudeño Vario surrounding El Sereno get shot multiple times and didn't even move. So when the car wrecks, the, the passenger gets out, a couple of people in the back get down, they're looking at Tonito, they're trying to help Tonito out, but the passenger is hit too. And they said that they seen the passenger go up to a payphone and make a phone call. And they're watching all this happen, traffic stopped, car, everybody's out their car, everybody is in a panic and a fright state of mind. And he said, not, not, that much, not that much longer later, a couple minutes later, a car pulls up and picks up everybody. Left Tonito there for dead. And they drove off to go look for that sedan, which he was assuming. And he also assumed that, you know, it was Lowell Street. And I guess that's how it all spiraled out of control. Because around that time, Tonito was trying to tax Lowell Street and they weren't going for it. They weren't going for it at all. And they did a bold move and they made a bold statement. You know, they refused to pay taxes to another man. Obviously, they looked at it from a Vario standpoint. Like, bro, we're not even from this fool's Vario. It's our Vario. Just because we're a sub click or a subsection of their group don't mean nothing. We ain't paying taxes for nothing. Now, whatever commotion and whatever conversations and whatever lack of communication was transpiring around that time, Lowell Street took a stance because I met a couple of them. And they took a stance and they said, you know what, we're just going to down them. That's going to be our message back. You want, you want this dollar bill? You can get in them bullets. Plata o plomo. And they gave that dude plomo. And they shot him down in broad daylight in front of everybody. Well, in December of 1992, after the video got greenlighted, they wound up blasting, per Mexican mafia orders, blasting two individuals in LA County Jail, but they survived it. But it wasn't until February of 1993 when they actually hit 30 something times, 30 some times, Jose Flaco Uribe from Lowell Street, and he lost his life in County Jail. Now I'm pretty sure he went into County Jail with the mind frame like, bro, I'm, my whole hood's green lighted, but I'm gonna make a stance. I'm not paying taxes to no big homie for no reason whatsoever. I don't know what their mind frame was. I can understand why I and others will say I would never pay taxes to another man anymore or period. So I don't know what Lowell Street's mind frame was at around that time. But he walked into county jail along with those two other individuals prior. And the man, mind you, the two that got hit before him was almost maybe two, three months before him. So I'm pretty sure he caught wind like my boys got blasted pretty bad, but they lived. So either he went in with a mentality like, I'm, I'm going to live through it too. I'm going to fight back. Or he went in with the mentality like, bro, I know where I stand. I know what my, I stand with my hood. I know that I'm going to get blasted, but I stand firm that we're not going to pay taxes. We refuse to work under that Mexican mafia umbrella. But he lost his life in the process. Standing firm in his belief system that he didn't want to pay a dollar more to another man, he lost his life in the process. But trip out on this, right? The Mexican mafia gives this contract to a particular individual. His name was Joaquin Diablo Alvaro. This individual was already facing trial because he shot in a car at a wrong vehicle and took a little boy's life, a 13-year-old little boy's life named Mario Martinez. So he was already going to get sanctioned a hit on him himself. But guess what? Since this individual was close friends with Jose Flaco Uribe, they figured, hey, bro, this individual can get close to that individual. So you know what? We're going to give this dude a contract. We're going to force this man's hands. We know what he did, and we're against, you know, taking kids' lives and shooting outside of vehicles and shooting at other vehicles and not hitting your target. Never mind that they said that they weren't supposed to be taking out kids' lives. They looked at him like, we'll give him a pass in the event he takes his life. Not just pokes him and lets him survive. He has to take his man's life. And that man does it. So he winds up facing trial for an in-house one and also for murdering a 13-year-old little boy.
So the war is going on for quite some time. And in 2001, a Lowell Street member named Paul Ramirez busts out a car while the, and tries to hit the driver and almost takes the life of a Log Street El Sereno member. But guess what they do? They wind up penalizing his brother in the end anyways. And a few years later, they wind up catching his brother slipping or a couple months later, if I'm not mistaken, and take his brother's life instead of taking his life. See how it's a deadly game? First, you got an individual who took the life of a 13-year-old little boy wrongfully and accidentally. I don't even like to use the word accident because regardless of the fact, it happened. But instead, the Mexican mafia says, you know what, we'll give him a pass and we'll let this one go as long as he takes another man's life. And he, will use, he was utilizing that such and in that fashion. And a man, a man like that, that's, he's not even thinking about the guilt and taking an innocent little boy's life. All he's worried about is saving his own life, self-preservation, self-interest. So to replace his guilt, it's all about redemption. It's all about, all right, let me take this man's life and this is okay. You know, two wrongs ain't gonna make it right. But according to him, as long as you make it right with the Mexican mafia members, everything's all good. No repercussions, no justice for this 13 year old little boy because this man gets to live, gets to do life in prison. I don't know if he ever got taken out in the process later on down the road, but he's doing life in prison. And whether he made it to be a big homie or he just wound up working for a big homie, or I don't know where his career is at or whatnot, but a 13 year old boy lost his life wrongfully because of street gang violence. And now you got another individual who decided to bang for his hood and have a shootout with rival gang members because they got his gang on site. Let's the man live on accident and then wind up getting his brother because they couldn't get to him. That's how the gang life really works. That's how the gang aspects really go about. You got one neighborhood who refused to pay taxes and instead, they, and because they knew they were going to go to war with everybody, made the first move, made the first hit, and it happened to be a big one, one of the big fishes, one of the great warriors, got green lighted for decades. And everybody just suffered the consequences because of the older generation refused to pay taxes. But yet, Mexican Mafia doesn't want to be known for their immoralities and how they serve justice for things like innocent people getting hurt in the process like they did with the Max and Roe tragedy. Gave this man a pass when he took out a 13-year-old little boy. Now, to me, situations like that deserve every form of criticism that there is. But I let the story speak for itself. So with that being said, like I always say, it's one life, one chance. You only got one chance to do this right. Let's get it done. Peace.